If you were to ask me, what are we doing and where are we going? We are on a very, very protracted and very deep mythological pilgrimage right now. That's how I see it. We don't F around, Keith. Our time is too short, Keith. Let's jump right in. Oh, goodness gracious. This is the Mindfulness Experience Podcast. My name is Keith Fifeson. On this podcast, Dr. Miles Neal and I spoke about his Buddhist psychotherapist process and practice in a number of areas. He's an author of Gradual Awakening, The Path of Becoming Fully Human, and Advances in Contemplative Psychotherapy. I've known him through the Contemplative Studies program, and I've also known him for over 10 years. I've had the great joy of learning with Dr. Miles over at Tibet House, the Ribbon Museum, even Sri Lanka. Miles and I talked about a lot of things. We talked about Buddhism, ancient wisdom, and why mindfulness alone may not be enough for our current times. Miles is a thought leader. He's brought together ancient wisdom and clinical psychology to help individuals better understand the way that they themselves can repattern their lives from the inside out and the outside in, as well as using ancient wisdom and cosmology and energetic patterns to really understand how to change the world. I enjoyed the conversation immensely. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Miles, what is happening? What is going on? Miles, let, tell me, l- tell me. Let's, let's hit the road and let's go. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Oh my God! What is happening? Oh God! We we are we are on a grand pilgrimage, you and I, Keith. And to be honest, I'm one of my fondest memories. I've I've known you for some decades, Keith. But one of my fondest memories is, of course, having you tower above the rest of the group while we walked barefooted around some of the great stupas of Sri Lanka. And the metaphor of being on pilgrimage is one I hold very dear i think it's a great metaphor symbol Mm -hmm. i also like the actual and literal version of pilgrimage but if you were to ask me what are we doing and where are we going we are on a very very protracted and very deep mythological pilgrimage right now that's how i see it that's the lens that's the lens through which i see it and since we have since we have both shared so much time together in life and in actual pilgrimage it would be a lovely thing to just use that as a little bit of a filter or lens through which we have a discussion oh my goodness gracious so we're 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 like doing the deep dive of the (laughs) we don't f around keith (laughs) our time is too short keith let's jump right in oh goodness gracious so let's talk about pilgrimage and what that actually means because I think you take it to a whole other extent. You've you've led all of these wonderful pilgrimages around the world. They're Buddhist pilgrimages that really allow individuals to go deep, but you take it to another level. It's not just about the sort of the woo-woo. It's really much more around the psychology, the neurology, the physiology, the biology of the individual, and really how they can go ahead and change that pattern it in a different way uh you know one of the things i love that you talked about is this whole idea of the flight simulator you know can you talk to that and how that relates to pilgrimage sure i mean the flight the flight simulator is a is a sort of descriptor that i use for the tibetan visualization system and in order to really appreciate the tibetan visualization system you have to you have to be acquaint your mind with a long-held paradigm that sacred wisdom cultures throughout the world have shared, which is that we are co-creators of reality. Mm-hmm. This is, doesn't just belong to Buddhism. It is a mystical, it is a mystic, is a defining principle of most mystical traditions where they understand that the world is not coming at you as a kind of cumbersome entity that is fixed. Rather, the world is illusion-like and in a kind of way, our minds are projecting reality based on prior memories, prior associations, prior emotions, prior, prior karmic propensities. This apparatus of seeing the world 
is largely unconscious. Now, what happens in the mystical traditions worldwide is that once you become initiated, your third eye is open to the responsibility and creativity that you have in the production, making, or construction of reality. Mm -hmm. And so the virtual reality simulator is a very nice way of understanding what's happening in the Tibetan Tantras, which is that you become an active agent. You become an active or voluntarily conscious co-conspirator or co-pilot in a flight simulator creation of your own world. And not to mention the time of what the time we're talking right now the landscape the landscape of, of of reality that we're sharing right now is one of disillusion and so just let me end this little you know this little riff by saying i can't imagine a more important time for people to be empowered with the sacred knowledge that they are actually powerful beings and that together we can co-create a new landscape of reality, much more harmonious, much more uh, sustainable, much more equitable, because it's all film, it's all illusion. It, the script has not, it's not predestined and it hasn't been written in stone. And so this is a very powerful message at, a, at this very critical juncture. So, like, what I'm hearing is uh, a sense that we create our own realities in, in, a, in a, you know, I mean, as above, so below, or as below, so above. So, the idea uh, from a quantum physics viewpoint, right, would be that um, based on the presence, based on your own presence and your own state of being, your own state of consciousness, you're able to go ahead and project into the world uh, sense of reality and to see the world uh, as the way you would like to see it. So your point is let's go ahead and create the kind of world that we would like to see rather than uh, be a part of the uh, the swirl, the, the ongoing uh, delusion, if you will, that really takes us away into this kind of Trump traumatic reality the 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 narrative the, the the common narrative that might be let's change that narrative and and through these pilgrimages you give people an opportunity to build community as well as to really change their story no? hey, I'm, that's perfectly put and then you could you could if you wanted to make it slightly bit more complex at the pilgrimages the, pil the actual pilgrimage is like an actual training ground for this type of initiation, mm. the one of seeing the world as malleable and remembering your own innate power. But then you can also say that life is a metaphoric pilgrimage, and the astrological time and place that we find ourselves right now is at a, as you know very well and probably much more in depth than I, Keith, which is the cusp between the Piscean and the Aquarian age is that we, the veils are thin between the ages and we're experiencing a cataclysmic <clears throat> dissolution. But at the same time, if you're very primed to see it, we are also seeing the budding of regeneration. They're coming together, death and rebirth at the very same time, <clears throat> co-dependent or co-arising together as one structure is melting, another one is emerging those that are in fear mode will only look at the demise of things. Those that are co-creation will celebrate the demise of things and participate in the reconstruction of things. Mm. And the more people that we can get to, to, to that level there of being able to surrender, let go of the old without fear and celebrate and participate in the construction of the new, this, I think, is the metaphoric or big level pilgrimage that I think as a global civilization we're on. Mm, mm. So, so this, uh, this opportunity to build community and, and take them and, and really help them to reconstruct or help them to see, um, you know, their inner being, right? The inner, the, the ability to, one of the things you've said to me in the past, and I've heard you say it a number of times, and you know I like this term, is the ability to have recognition and choice. Uh, because we're really in a world of trauma, right? We, I think we've got this collective trauma that's impacting us all. 
whether or not it's the war in Ukraine, whether or not it's the economy, the bit, uh, the digital uh, currency, the great resignation, all of these things that are happening around us, we see a lots of stuff happening. So tell me a little bit about how you help people to gain uh, the recognition and choice to, you know, the ability to change the story, if you will, to change the channel, to tune into something differently. You talked about this ability to, you know, uh, increase our uh, frequency. You you had mentioned that word. What does that mean? Yeah, well, it's interesting in the context of our relationship, Keith, because I've known you for for a decade, and when when we first met, I think you liked this idea of recognition and choice, and it's still very much part of our conversation. Uh, and it can be applied. It can be applied to many different domains. So I think when we first met, it may have just been in the context of mindfulness, the mindfulness revolution. Okay, and there. The simple practice of paying attention, which is so eloquently put in your recent book and and what you've talked about much in your work. Thank you for that, Miles. (laughs) Yes. I mean, listen, it's it's no small thing to put out a book. So I admire your courage and your effort. And in that book, you, you do have a section in mindfulness, and it has been part of your work mindfulness and your executive trainings and the rest of it. Mm-hmm. In that context, recognition and choice is simply a, 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 a leverage point mm-hmm. to slow down using presence, the frame-by-frame frame film of reality, sufficient enough that you can disrupt automaticity automaticity Mm -hmm. and insert volition or conscious will and so it could be as simple as you have a knee-jerk reaction that is a bugaboo with you and your wife or spouse or partner it could be a habit that you have at work it could be a tendency that you know once done twice three times that tendency becomes ingrained and then it has consequences If you use mindfulness, you have a leverage, you have a crowbar, you can slowly disrupt the habit cycle. And once you slow it down, then you can regain conscious volition to intervene and interject Mm -hmm. a new trajectory, a new pathway, a new habit, a new state of mind, what have you. That's sort of the crux of the mindfulness Mm -hmm. revolution, as you and I both know, and it's very familiar in... In con- pop culture, this idea of the right. uh, of operating in the gap, mm-hmm. I'm sure you've yep. you've used that in your trainings, right? So it's really empowering people to see that they can slow down. They don't have to let momentum of habit take them into the path well traveled. They can exercise consciousness to go in the road less traveled, and there find a new adventure. Now. The recognition and choice that I'm now talking about has, of course, the same premise, uh, but it's just in a larger, more mythological or astrological context, which is the recognition of understanding your own true nature. Mm, 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 mm. Not just exercising the power of presence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, in other words, the recognition is the same, but what it recognizes can be different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the and, mindf- yeah. I was, just, I was just going to jump in there uh, because I, I really believe one of the things that you do so well is you help people through the process of not only uh, looking at the Mahayana path and the gradual path, uh, you know, to create the framework and the container for really self-compassion for really self-love, to really go ahead and not only love themselves, but also to bring that love out into the world through the visualization visualization practices and the wisdom. Because that to me, you know, I've heard it said that, you know, the wings of mindfulness are compassion and wisdom, but often you hear that, but you don't really get it. You know, there's no real you know, there's some compassion training. There's not a lot of wisdom training out there, you know, and I think what you're doing is you're bringing all of those tools together um, by helping people to understand, you know, hey, yeah, you can be mindful, but you could be a sharpshooter and really tear down the world in a very mindful way if you don't have the compassion and the wisdom to really understand 
that, you know, we are all not only interconnected, but the world is our mother or, you know, our planet. This is how we feed ourselves is how we feed our children. I mean, there's a whole history here. Can you talk to that a little bit? Because I, I, what, what I'm really seeing from a mindfulness viewpoint is that a lot of people are afraid of Buddhism. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're interested in it because we've taken out the mindfulness out of Buddhism. They're interested in that. But they're not really they're not really going into the science here of Buddhism. And I think you're doing that in a very, you know, in a very, very prescriptive way, but also in a very, you know, um, a mindful way, if you will. They're really saying, hey, this is about your physiology. It's about your neurology. This is about the way everything works. Can you talk to that perhaps a little bit? I know there's a lot to unpack there. So, I mean, this is basically a, 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 a conflict of paradigm. Okay, most of us have been indoctrinated and have exported until it's become global the paradigm of reductionism. Scientific reductionism basically in in a nutshell is all that is real is what you can f experience with your five senses. Okay, from that point of view, it's highly mechanistic. And the way that we understand mindfulness largely is from this mechanistic standpoint. Now, that doesn't diminish the value of course, there's a lot of research which is scientific and materialistic or reductionistic that proves that mindfulness has better outcome for depression, better uh, outcome for anxiety, uh, more capability to act as flow state, uh, improves uh, well-being. A lot of a lot of the research that you covered in your book and others have covered it. So I'm not disparaging the materialistic paradigm. I'm just saying that's not the paradigm that Buddhism was coming from when it advocates for mindfulness. And so if we're really going to do justice, we can't be so much an imperialist and sort of mining for the goal that we want and dis disregarding the rest. Let's also have a look at what mindfulness is doing in the tradition itself in order to really appreciate its grand vision. And there the grand vision is not just using mindfulness as a simple technique for stress reduction so that we can exercise our will. In other words, like I have a nasty habit of overeating, for example, and if I become very sensitized, I can see the, the cues in my body that I've had enough, the satiated cues, I can alert myself to more subtle cues and then train myself rather than grabbing for the extra scoop I can start to maybe make a phone call to a sponsor right. or I can choose better food habits. Uh, so I can exercise recognition and choice. Now, that's sort of a reductionistic, believe me, this can really be helpful. I mean, a lot of the ways that it um, has changed people's mm -hmm. lives because they've been able to exercise will to choose something that leads to greater well-being. Right. You, and you don't have to be a Buddhist to do that. There's, there's absolutely no religious dogma to buy into. That's the beauty and the upside of the reductionistic paradigm. It, it has always been skeptical of dogmas and religions, and so it's basically plain to see anyone can have a buy-in. If, if you have a rational mind, I mean, that's, you know, since the age of reason, the, the, the paradigm of reductionism is, is, is a co-conspirator or co-created on the basis of reason. So there, look, everybody who's reasonable can see, look, if I practice this thing and I gain some fluency with my mind, I can disrupt dysfunctional habits in a nutshell. What's going on in the Buddhist tradition is something that's, it transcends the materialistic or reductionistic paradigm. There's a spiritual dimension. There is what I love to call, borrowing from Bob Thurman, the multi-life perspective, okay? We are infinite beings, infinite consciousness. We have no beginning. We have no end. We can migrate according to karmic principles, according to momentum, the momentum of habit. We can migrate into various life forms of misery and various life forms of abundance. And the Buddha, then the Buddha said, and that, that was there before the Buddha arrived. That was already there in the Vedic cultures. Then the Buddha said, this, this whole this whole ecosystem, if you will, of ascending and descending as a result of karmic propensities itself is a kind of binding that he called samsara, which can be transcended or itself disrupted. How so? 
Well, it's not just bringing awareness to bear, but it's also using awareness as a platform to cultivate two other uh, wings that you have already referenced, which is the virtue wing, compassion wing, or a sensibility wing, mm-hmm. uh, sen- resensitizing ourselves to virtue, integrity, and ethics. Mm-hmm. On the other side is the wisdom wing, which is what I call quantum view, which is transcending the materialistic vision of the world so that you can see there's much more fluency Mm -hmm. that you aren't a static object other people aren't static the world isn't static everything is much more fluid and with that fluidity it can be it can be like clay it can be molded Mm -hmm. something that feels intractable dangerous threatening and traumatizing isn't so inherently Mm -hmm. what it is inherently is much more flow even an atom can be penetrated And the quantum level analysis of an atom shows that it's much more space and Mm wave-like. And this is really very in line with the Buddhist tradition. And more importantly, how do we apply such a vision? Mm -hmm. Well, you just take any traumatizing event. Mm -hmm. For you and I, with the people that we coach and see, a traumatizing event feels very rigid, static, hopeless. Mm -hmm. It's, It's almost calcified. I'm a bad person. I'm a victim. The world is unthreatening. Uh, the world is threatening. The world is dangerous. Mm-hmm. And that feeds back on one's nervous system. Mm-hmm. You, you become more you become more hypervigilant. Mm-hmm. With your hypervigilant, you're also prone to the rebound effect of depression. You become lethargic, you become paralyzed. Uh, you then isolate, you lose your social connection, and the world spins out of control in a negative direction. Mm-hmm. Now, if you apply wisdom and compassion and mindfulness to that scenario, you see that your na- your nature is infinitely flexible. There is, mm-hmm. this is the ultimate medicine to hopelessness. Mm-hmm. Ho- hopelessness is that there's everything is intractable, unchangeable. Mm-hmm. And the Buddha said, nothing withstands the prospect of change. Nothing. And people get freaked out by that, but that is an actual. Right. <laughs> that's a huge. That's a huge victory when you're depressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, I like to say that we're really verbs, not nouns. You know that we're. And uh, in the book, I've talked about the uh, root word for breath is spear, S P I R, as in spear it or aspiration or inspiration or perspiration. You know, we breathe life into the world and the world breathes life into us. So it's a question of how are we breathing? How are we recognizing or choosing? Um, And you know, there was something that I thought about you uh, just the other day. My wife was telling me about somebody who was talking to her and said, you know, well, why does God do bad things? If 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 God is omniscient, why does God let bad things happen? And you know, I was, I was, I, I came back to her. I was like, you know, well, you know, God. Uh, well, first of all, you know, we are embodying, you know, God in everything that we do. So we're ta- we need to take agency. Whereas a lot of, and I think there is this science that really says, you know, like we're responsible. We're hmm. responsible. It's not like there's some other force outside that's kind of saying to us no you sit down while i destroy the world no it's yeah. like we're we're like doing it we're in charge of it hello yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it reminds me of uh you know, anytime you have one of these problems you can put it on a spectrum and you can see that there's always two polar opposites or extremes on the one side there's the scientific hard problem mm-hmm. the scientific hard problem is how, how does mind intersect with matter Hmm. like if i think to move my hand how does that work and they they can't yet explain it because they can't yet they don't yet understand the mechanism by which consciousness because they don't really have a full understanding of consciousness in fact they dismiss consciousness but the hard problem in science has something to do with the relationship between immaterial and and matter how do these two worlds intersect? On the other side of the equation is the, the existential version of this conundrum, this, this impassable point, which is, if God is omnipotent and God is all compassionate, why do people suffer? Mm-hmm. And this is, the, this is the inverse hard problem of science in the religious mm-hmm. worldview. It's one that 
the saints and and religious scholars have debated for a long time and have come up with, you know, just just as the scientists have scratching their heads, you know, this is the theological inverse. And this is where Buddhism comes in because it it really doesn't position itself nor as an absolute science, nor as an absolute religion, mm-hmm. but it chooses a middle way. And with choosing a middle way, it creates a lot of complexities and a conundrum onto itself. But it also has much more leeway at a resolution or an integration, that the world is material and divine, mm-hmm. uh, that, that the world, you know, that there there are other agencies and entities, gods, if you like, but none of them have power or control over your destiny. Mm-hmm. So you're taking from science rationality and reason, and you're taking from religion, you know, the power of the mind or the power of consciousness, and you're taking it out of the context of an external being, and you're, you're adopting it yourself. So in, in some way, it's a spiritual science, and as you say, the net result of it is you are God. Mm-hmm. And you are the God, how about this? You are the God of your own creation. You are the God of your own world. You're writing your own script. You're writing your own story. So that's, yeah, the pop culture or the new age version of saying that is, is that, you know, you're, you are the author. Mm-hmm. But that's, again, not much different than what the ancients have mm-hmm. discussed or put forward for a long time. You are the God of your world. Now, that doesn't mean... You can snap your fingers and the whole world changes. Why? Because there are eight thousand, eight million, eight billion other gods that 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 mm-hmm. share the the canvas together. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Right. So, so it's not it's not like it's not it's not an invitation to act like a narcissist <laughs> <Right>. sociopath. <laughs> that I am God. No, you don't want to say that. But what you're what you're doing is you're looking for reference and you're looking for guidance along that line. And I'm uh, and you know from whether or not it's from the Hindu, you know, uh, 20,000 gods, or whether or not it's from the Buddhist perspective, you know, um, I'm just wondering, do you think that, you know, Buddhism is the answer? I mean, are there other paths? Uh, You know, we started talking about the jewel tree, you know, and, you know, what that actually means for individuals. And I'm just, you know, you wanted to go deeper into this conversation and, you know, just kind of not just keep it with mindfulness. And I spoke to a guy who was just about the science of mindfulness, secular mindfulness, you know, the science of applying it to organizations. And his view is like, hey, let's forget with the woo woo. Let's forget all that. Let's look at productivity. Let's look at how we can go ahead and up our sales. You know, yeah. let's go ahead and focus on that. You know, you know, this is a this is a very different track that we're on here. Right? You know, and it, you know, I just really want to be clear. Let's go deep. Do you have to be a Buddhist? Can you come to this as a like I'm a, I'm an interfaith minister? Can I can you come to this regardless of what your path is and still apply the principles of Buddhism and how? Yeah, that's a great question. I I'm, I've migrated over the course of my career. I I'm now writing another book. That's you know my last book was on Buddhism. I'm a strong proponent of Buddhism. I I'm a practicing. Vajrayana or tantric practitioner in the Tibetan tradition. I, I love Buddhism through and through, um, but I have a much more eclectic and open-minded, interdisciplinary um, vision at the moment. And I'll tell you the reason why is because every point of view has its own inherent blind spot, mm-hmm. even Buddhism. Now, maybe not theoretical Buddhism, but in a way, that's not the Buddhism that is lived. Every lived tradition has its own blind spot, Mm. not because of the tradition, but because of the practitioner. So that's another way of saying it doesn't matter. the, The prospects of the theoretical religion or philosophy is irrelevant. Every human being that subscribes to a point of view is prone to their own blind spot. And as a result of that, I have found interdisciplinary dialogues and interdisciplinary approaches can serve the function of covering multiple blind spots. So when you are a Westerner, you've been heavily traumatized and you fall into a Tibetan or Hindu yoga tradition Mm -hmm. and there are certain practices that are prescribed for your, your symptoms 
There may not be the sensitivity, there may not be the framework that's really relevant to, to really address your trauma. And so for that reason, I started branching out. I started combining Tibetan Buddhism with uh, in-depth trauma work. I, then I went from trauma work into mythology, then from mythology into interdisciplinary myst- mysticism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my current book is really about seeing the overlaps in mysticism. Mm. The, the, tr- the mystical traditions do share a very common core. And this will bring our conversation full back to pilgrimage. The why, the reason that I like pilgrimage as a scaffolding or a metaphor is it because it really is, it cuts across all mystical traditions, mm-hmm. whether they are alchemy, whether they are the psychedelic potions of the early Christian or Dionysian traditions of Greece, whether they are the Indian Hindu yoga or Tibetan Tantric traditions, Mm -hmm. all of them have a commonality, which is a motif Mm -hmm. that I'm, that serves as the main loom for the weave of my new book, which is to descend Mm -hmm. from the place of ego, Mm -hmm. the place of calcification, Mm -hmm. the place of identification, narrow identification, Mm -hmm. and to descend into what Jung called the shadow, Mm -hmm. where things are much more amorphous and scary and frightening. Mm -hmm. In that place, there is a moment that Joseph Campbell called about the confronting of the dragon or the confronting of the dragon. I knew you were going to go there. I knew you. I was really hoping you were going to go there into the hero's journey. Oh, good, good, good. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, how can you not? Because it really cuts through every tradition and every epoch and every culture, whether you're talking about Africa or Indonesia, Australia, Europe, Asia, this monomyth is universal. It's a universal archetype. Now, it can be, you know, I had a very interesting conversation with Phil Cozano, the mythologist, that we can, we, can, we can reference in a second. But let me just finish the pilgrimage because it does cut across all traditions and it does answer your question, do you have to be Buddhist? Absolutely not. You don't have to be Buddhist as long as you're practicing a, in a mystical way, as long as you're following the trajectory or the pilgrimage route into the netherworlds into the divine realms, into the mythopoetic realm, Mm. you will leave the familiar confines of rigid identities and waking consciousness and you will enter the dream world. Mm. Mm -hmm. And in the dream world, there are both demons and angels to be encountered. And there will be a great battle to fight. And in that battle, great, you know, the opportunity to collect resources that have been ill wasted mm-hmm. on defending against fears. Once you confront the dragon, once you pull the sword from stone, those energies that have been ill, uh, ill used, ill utilized, are yours to bear again. Let me give you an example. Most of us are bound up in tremendous amounts of judgment, mm-hmm. self persecution, or fear. Mm-hmm. From an energy point of view, it really is just energy that's bound up in this kind of objectionable kind of trajectory. But that energy can be transformed into self-compassion, for example. If you just look at the narratives of people that have a lot of depression, Mm -hmm. underlying it is a lack of self-worth and a punitive Mm -hmm. Mm self-contempt. It's energy. Mm -hmm. Now, if they, if they did one of these confrontations of the dark night of the soul, if they went on an external pilgrimage, if they did a pilgrimage with psychedelics, mm-hmm. if they had a mystical practice that carried them into the netherworlds where they could do, de- do, do this kind of demon work with mm-hmm. perhaps it's a parent that abused them, perhaps it's a society that outcasts them, and actually reclaim that energy and convert it mm. into self-compassion, which is based on this quantum view that everything is open just because you've been injured by trauma doesn't mean it's a a a a a branding in stone then you can you can consolidate you can integrate and the journey doesn't stop there then there is the ascension or the return 
Then you come back a wounded healer to help your societies, to help your tribe, and you bring with yourself a, a new set of visions. Mm -hmm. You have an expanded vision as a result of your pilgrimage to Sri Lanka. You have an expanded vision as a result of your ayahuasca taking. You have an expanded vision as a result of your mystical practice. You have an expanded vision if you have a sexual encounter of great delight, even. It is true that when you have a sexual encounter based on love and not grasping, two separate egos do unite in the confluence, and the intermingling is the kind of crescendo or the axis mundi, uh, the great gathering of orgasmic bliss, void. Where the woo-wee, one... the woo-wee. The, the way when there is a merger into oneness right. Right. and then there is the ascension where you come back out of it back into your separate dyads with your spouse mm -hmm. but now you have the the blissful afterglow where you're radiant and things are much more fluid even though you occupy your distinction again mm -hmm. and so this is this motif is universal it's something that i'm deeply deeply invested in it's part of the you know, the thing that I want to share in the new book, Return with the Elixir. Mm. And it's found through all tradition. It's found through sacred pilgrimage. It's, th it's found through sexual intimacy. It's found through psychedelics. It's found through mystical practice. And so, no, of course not. You don't have to be Buddhist. If you look with the eyes of discernment, you can find this everywhere. Right. Right, right. And that's, and that's so beautiful. And, you know, I use that term, woo we, it's a Taoist term, you know, it's the everything and the nothing. It's the great crescendo of the yin and the yang together in the tantric uh, uh, yabyum. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful space to be in. But you've really articulated in such a, a wonderful way in terms of pilgrimage and in terms of the ability to go ahead and revisit some old wounds and old traumas to repurpose, to reframe, to go ahead and, and, and really integrate in a, in a new way that you're able to go ahead and be in the world. And I, I really love that. So, um, you know, I'm uh, looking at the time and I, I, I can't believe that we've already, uh, you know, spent about uh, close to an hour here. I feel like we've like we're, we're just, just getting started, my friend. <laughs> no, started. Just getting... Oh, we've no. been on a long, long pilgrimage, and we can have dialogues infinitum. You and I, oh, uh, oh, uh, Keith. Oh. If, if it's it's the kind of thing where you sit by a virtual fire, and these kinds of dialogues transcend time and space. They just it's it's what Phil Casano calls the art of the long conversation. It never it never stops. Right, you just reconnect right. and you can just keep going. Right, right, right. And I I love that. And, uh, you know, for people who uh, aren't familiar with you and your work, uh, you have the uh, CSP uh, program, which is the Contemplative Studies program. And you're doing uh, quite a few other things as well. I mean, off of that, that's an ongoing program that's resident there. Uh, can you just uh, help people to understand how they can get a hold of you and read some of your work or see some of your videos? Because you've got a ton of stuff that's uh, available for folks. I'm working on many fronts. I'm feeling very buoyed and inspired. You know, one of the things I like to do is pilgrimage. So, you know, we have a pilgrimage that has just sold out. It's heading to India in October with the great Tibetan Lama Geshe Tenzin Zopa. We will be going three weeks from the high Himalayas through the Kathmandu Valley and all the way to the source of enlightenment under the Bodhi tree in, in northern India yes. in October. Pilgrimage is something I like to run every year as a result of COVID. We had to shut that down for a couple of years, suspend the operation. The next pilgrimage is already in gear for 2023, having spent six weeks on the island of Bali and meeting wisdom keeper Jokade, a, a man of great integrity. We came up with a vision for our pilgrimage in 2023, which will take us to the islands of Indonesia, Amazing. beginning beginning with Sumatra and following uh, Lama Atisha, who was a Buddhist practitioner of the Lojung or mind training tradition, the, the one of the pith essence of combining wisdom and compassion. Mm -hmm. He learned that from his teacher in the islands of Surma, uh, uh, Sumatra called, his teacher was called Sri Ling, Sir Lingpa. So we'll be doing a, a pilgrimage to follow it in his footsteps. We'll go from Sumatra to the island of Java to the great Borobudur, 
uh, mandala, which is the largest Buddhist monument on the planet. It sits in a valley be uh, flanked by two volcanoes. Mm. If you ever wanted a mythological place, that would be it. And we will end by doing a healing retreat, natural healing retreat in Bali, in the field, in the uh, rice paddy, mm. and on the farm of Wisdom Keeper Chakaday, where we'll do ceremony. Wow. So I like to I like to bring people on these kinds of excursions. I think there are, as my work is inter in, inter uh, interdisciplinary. So there's aspects of mythology, aspects of Buddhist philosophy, aspects of meditation and yoga, also aspects of uh, trauma work and, and group work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also do the courses at the CSP, which are now all housed online and archived as a kind of library, the ones that you did with me, Keith, the two-year program and the one-year program. I also do psychotherapy, of course, my practice, and anybody who's doing individual work right now, I, I guess, is fairly full because, uh, you know, the inundation of the archetype of the COVID pandemic has meant that people are really reevaluating their lives. And, and it's a good thing to reach out for help at that time. It's a good thing to get with a one-on-one a -on -one coach or at least a group to help you find your ground and reboot your vision and to process whatever latent traumas or of impact that are digesting and sort of um, <clears throat> co-opting your energy. So this is about energy renewal. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing for people to reach out. That's one of the services I do do. And then finally, I have books. So Gradual Awakening I have a contemplative psychotherapy book that I added. My new book now I'm writing, Return with the Elixir, it should take me about a year. Just sign the contract with a new publisher. So I'm, I'm and of course, and thank you. And I'm, finally, I do what you do, Keith, which is, you know, these kind of conversations, I, I very much have started to really appreciate and really enjoy. So my, my podcast is called The Wisdom Keeper Podcast. And the Wisdom Peeper podcast is to invite in holders of sacred knowledge, whether they be astrology or uh, alchemy or uh, pilgrimage leaders or uh, philo philosophy, masters of philosophy, in order for us, for them to guide us through the archetype of the transition from the Aquarian to the, Pi uh, from the Piscean to the Aquarian age. So that's my hope is to offer Wisdom Keepers a platform to help us find our way and navigate our way through this dark night, collective dark night of the soul. So mm. thank you, Keith, mm -hmm. for inviting me on your podcast. Let me just ask you a question, my friend. Sure. How are you feeling given your uh, recent uh, offer to the world of your book and your starting of your podcast? I know this is your fairly recent getting going here. And how have you been doing? How has the experience been going for you on the podcast? What, what kind of meaning are you deriving from it? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for being here and taking the time and providing uh, everyone with such in-depth knowledge and uh, experience and a different perspective than what the everyday man might, uh, you know, look at, right? Uh, and for me, you know, the mindfulness experience is not only about, you know, just practicing mindfulness, it's about how we bring ourselves into every aspect of life. So I have had a lot of fun with it. I, 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 I've always like the opportunity to go ahead and have conversations and uh, uh, it's been uh, fun in a number of areas because we've looked at not only the corporate culture uh, we've looked at as i said to you we had uh, someone on talking about mindfulness uh, in an organizational setting uh, we also had george lewis on who really talked about the astrology and the cultural aspect of it uh, and uh, the philosophy of how we can get caught up in the narratives uh, and what uh, is really happening above as as below and mm -hmm. now you're providing some insight uh, from a buddhist viewpoint and i really hope uh, we have some other guests that are coming on which should be very exciting uh in the short term someone talking about compassion a good friend uh, who runs the compassion institute um so there's uh, for me it's an opportunity to really explore all these topics and bring them back. I really don't think mindfulness is uh, as much of a, uh, I don't think it's uh, as much of a practice as it's a way of life. You know, every time we breath, I, I always said, you know, there are these sacred moments of truth. So every breath that we take is a sacred moment. Every opportunity that we have with someone is a sacred moment. 
and this has been a sacred moment for me. So uh, me too. I was just going to say that, Keith. Any time with you has been a real blessing. I, I'm I'm really grateful for our friendship, and it has been an enduring one through many contexts. And so you know, thank you so much. It is it is, yeah. it is really a pleasure to to be with you and to converse with you and to think deeply about the world at this at this stage in the game. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Miles. Uh, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you for being a part of the Mindfulness Experience podcast. I hope you enjoyed this show and the frank and honest discussion that I had with Miles, Dr. Miles Neal. I also hope that you gained some valuable insights on how mindfulness, Buddhism, psychology, and life itself and transformation all work together, how we can change our stories and change the world. Please follow the podcast to connect with future ones as well. Subscribe, leave us a review, or suggest any topics that you yourself would like to hear. We'd love that. Connect with us on social media or visit our website, workmindfulness.com, for more mindfulness experiences. Thank you again. See you in the next show. Take care.